welcome everybody. Once again, we have another guest. We'll have yet another exciting discussion. And this time, uh, we are privileged to have Dennis uh, on the call. Dennis is the CEO of Yuki. Um, so just a quick background on Yuki. Yuki is a company that was launched in 2022 by a Nigerian investor and robo-advisory startup called Komi Block. Yuki gives African fintechs and neobanks APIs that make it easy to create and offer unique crypto solutions. For instance, any fintech could use Yuki to build a remittance service, stablecoin payments, crypto trading service, uh, ETC in a week instead of months. They don't have to write any complex code or worry about compliance in getting licenses or AML. So we are really excited to talk to Dennis and uh, I want to introduce uh, Dennis uh, you know, to this discussion. Hi, Dennis. Hi, uh, David. How are you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing fun. I hope I got that introduction right. Yeah, I think is, uh, it depends on how anybody wants to define it, but it, it is, it is what it is. And actually it's very correct. So what we do at Yuki, uh, Yuki is basically a decentralized web tree infrastructure as a service for African financial companies. We started Yuki out of experience because we are building the uh, robo advisory products. It, it occurred to us that the infrastructures and the tools we need to get done what we need to build is not readily available for African financial companies. Like building a Web3 solution at a scale with compliance and uh, everything you need to get it running, treasury, liquidity, and the rest of that is something that is not a hand-me-down for so many African companies. So we decided to create uh, a solution for Africa specifically. So yeah, that is how, um, that is what we're doing specifically at the UK. Because when you average out the building journey of every startup with three companies, especially those ones that are early stage in Africa, you find that many of them spend time in researching or talking to counterparties they will need to use rather than time they need to spend on building their actual products. So yeah. So that is actually uh, the Yuki uh, ethos or what drives us as Yuki to build this first. Oh, great. All right. Uh, great. Thanks, uh, Dennis. I think we'll get into a bit more detail uh, during the discussion. Mm -hmm. But basically, I wanted to, you know, first of all, ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, who you are mm -hmm. and uh, how you actually, you know, got started with Yuki and you're not actually in the web three space. Yeah, I'm actually a product manager by career. Um, started getting into web three back in 2019, 2018. Uh, think about my first crypto while in college. So I was taking off crypto from the hands of my folks back there in the university. Uh, they were, some of them had Bitcoin and Ethereum. They were kind of like, oh, they need to sell it. Though I've already, I basically read the Ethereum white paper back in college. I didn't actually get to understand more about Bitcoin. I was my introduction into the Web3 space was through Ethereum. So since then, back in college, I did some kind of hedge fund kind of stuff back in school, where I take most of these crypto from them and help them trade it. Then um, after school, I got into product management from there. I was basically focused on building financial products for fintech companies uh, like OP and the rest of them. So back 2020, after the COVID period, I embarked on my first uh, crypto journey full squad with a team. So we started building a, a crypto bank called Send Village. From there, we pivoted back to Scummy Blocks. And yeah, this is where we are right now, building Yuki or something like that. So I think the journey has just been uh, an experience driven journey of okay you're building this you encounter this problem oh this is a bigger opportunity can we pivot and solve this and the rest of that so yeah that just be my story man awesome always nice to hear founder journeys um now you know i know you briefly uh, talked about yuki but again uh just in in in, uh, in a few sentences how do you describe yuki uh and what you guys do at yeah, as I said earlier, I think it's API infrastructure for African financial companies. Web3 cannot be adopted in Africa if Web2 is not pushing it. They just face the reality. And that is what Yuki is here for. We are here to give both Web3 and Web2 companies 
the middleware infrastructure to make real adoption possible, not just trading or anything, but to drive it down to the last mile. That is basically why we are existing. And we're doing it in a very secure and decentralized way. We don't believe in custodying people's assets. We believe blockchain web should be decentralized like the way Satoshi designed it to be. So that's just basically what we are doing here. We're using different technologies like multi-party computation and the rest of that to make um, our wallet infrastructure decentralized and the rest of our product infrastructure. So yeah, that is just what we are here for. All right, awesome. Now, for, for people who don't understand, you know, the technical jargon that you're using, you know, you're talking about APIs mm. and Web3 infrastructure. Do you mind breaking down to us what's an API, for example, and also along that line, how does the UK API look like? And also a bit on how Web3 infrastructure looks like and how UK is solving uh, a problem that exists. Yeah, I think API is like a connecting rod, I would say, for the new uh, economy. So uh, just think about it as how will I, I, I like to explain this into folks that does, are not into tech. So think of APIs as the, okay, you have a television in your house and then you have the power outlets where the power came, come, comes into your house. You can't actually uh, just, uh, if you don't have the socket in your house, you can't plug your television directly to the transformer. So the API is just that pool that brings it down. And then that extension that brings it down to your parlor where you can now, you're sitting where you can now plug your television and then you can now enjoy the light from the transformer. That is basically what APIs are in a very layman term. Is that connecting piece that allows companies to build different products without complexity. So Web3 infrastructure generally actually has to do with what runs, what the Web3 uh, services, like cryptocurrency, tokens, or the rest of them, all the economies on the Web3, what they run on. We have different uh, middleware infrastructures in Web3. We have the blockchains, we have the wallets. There are so many primitives, programmability, composability, and so many of them. But in a general sense of things, I would describe it as the building blocks of what the whole things you see on different exchanges, the transactions, the money sending across the globe, what they run on, the nodes and the services that is powering them. That is actually what I can describe as the Web3 infrastructure generally. And by default, it's decentralized. Nobody has full control over it generally. So that is generally what Web3 infrastructure is. I don't know if I broke it down it very well, but I think the best of my jargon knowledge, that is it. Yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. You have tennis. Just diving a bit into the UK APIs themselves. Uh, can you describe them a, a bit? Yeah, I think the UK API product is broken into, uh, we have four uh, API service kits, right? So we, we can bundle the products in together. Uh, we have different, four different uh, features in the UK API infrastructure. We have the MPC wallet as a service. So on the MPC wallet as a service is where we build out our wallet workflows. Companies that want to deploy crypto solutions specifically uh, can use the wallet infrastructure is the base for every transaction on the blockchain. You can't transact on the blockchain without the wallet. So it's kind of like, you can't have anything to do with the bank without the bank account. That is just what a uh, wallet is actually. And then we have uh, this wallet and service infrastructure, which is the biggest driver because many of the wallets we have right now are centralized wallets, meaning that the private keys uh, the authorizing key that you use to sign transactions on those wallets to like kind of approve transactions to funds to leave the wallet are held by a single entity. This is actually the problem that caused FTX. We saw what happened with FTX and so many other exchanges uh, last year and early this year. So are you key that infrastructure is decentralized? The user controls the private key, signs the transactions and approve when money leaves on the, their wallet. Even if the companies that are using our APIs, uh, the, the companies using our API don't even have access to the funds of, the, of, the, of their users. So that is where the MPC comes in. We take that single private key and distribute it, break it down into diff different uh, parts and distribute it among uh, counterparties that helps the user hold the private key. The user has the authorizing key. Then we and the company integrating our APIs hold the uh, confirming confirmation keys or something like that. 
So then we have the liquidity as a service. So on that liquidity as a service, it's kind of an overflow what we actually build on Comi Block. So it provides companies access to liquidity uh, from exchange liquidity. We are connected to so many exchanges. So it makes it easy for people to trade without slippages and the rest of that and very uh, low trading fees and something like that. Then we have the compliance as, as a service. It's something we are doing in partnership with Chainalysis, still building it and coming up. So it allows you to do KYT and uh, KYT and AML checks. So you know your transactions. Whenever money is coming into the UK ecosystem, uh, the wallet is being screened to make sure that the wallet is not uh, a uh, crime-related wallet. Whenever money is leaving and the rest of that. So all those checks is actually very important for the companies you are working with because so many of them are regulated uh, institutions as well. And then we have the fiat on and off ramp service. It's one of the exciting things about this product. Uh, we because UK. Uh, fintechs natively sit within the UK ecosystem. We work with traditional fintechs. So we are partnering with these fintechs and some other crypto native companies in, in Africa generally to build something we call A to A fiat on an off ramp. So accounts to account settlements. So because we have fintechs within the UK ecosystem and these fintechs have fiat accounts and they also integrated crypto wallet internally. So we are empowering their users to be able to become liquidity providers because one of the biggest issues in Africa right now is fiat on, on and off rep. It's not because the liquidity is not there, it's there, but it's fragmented across different counterparties and platforms. And the entry level to become a merchant or liquidity provider on so many platforms are so very high, high. You have to have some certain amount of money and the rest of that. So at UK, we are making it possible that everybody that has a UK wallet through API, our API connectivity can become a liquidity provider a partnership with most of the fintech companies you're working with. And we're also kind of like recruiting companies that have built on our off-ramp solutions to join the network, to be able to expand the possibility of what that can be done. Because right now, I'm not sure you can be able to off-ramp or on-ramp 10 to $15,000 on crypto easily in Africa. It has to take a long period of time. We want to break down that process and make it faster. So we're kind of like thinking about it from a different angle, building it as an exchange model where uh, a request comes in, we broadcast the request across the network and people fill in the order, like as if they are filling orders on exchange or something like that. So it's an interesting adventure for us around that product, around that part of our product. And we are currently building, um, working with companies, talking to companies like ClickSpecer and the rest of them to kind of like join in and make this a possibility for Africa. All right. Uh... Thanks for that detailed breakdown, Dennis. It sounds like you're you're taking a very unique approach to. I, I like the on off ramp, the off ramp part of it. Um, I'm just curious that, you know, um, that model. How, how is that model working for you so far? Maybe you can, as you as you respond to that, you can let us know. How do you partner with people? We recently saw your partnership with Aladdin Digital. I think that was uh, uh, what most of our readers have have uh, seen or they've you know discovered UK from that partnership. Just curious, how do you work with partners and how does that you know Alan uh, you know Aladdin Digital partnership look like? Yeah, I, I think um, the on and off ramp infrastructure is actually very interesting because it's something that we developed out of Celo Camp, right? So we are kind of like think that it, it, we can't scale our business if we don't have adequate on and off ramp solution. So that problem drove us mad into finding a solution that can actually scale alongside the companies that we are bringing into the eco ecosystem. So how we actually work with companies is on, if I'm, we analyze companies we work with from an impact perspective, right? So we look at companies, uh, we have this uh, defining persona on our customer persona profile. We say we service financial comp and pioneering African financial companies. Like we look for companies that are eager, ready to move, adapt and build infrastructures that can change their uh, product offering as fast as possible. So I think Aladdin partnership is a very interesting partnership. We had a relationship at, at, with Aladdin at Comi Blocks and then UK. Uh, we 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 are invest. Um, we had the same investor uh, invested in the both companies at the same time. So kind of like we are a co-portfolio companies of Espad Dojo and the rest of that. So that relationship actually we got us talking, and then he was like, I didn't even know that he they'd be struggling with that particular solution since 2021. They've been trying to put alpha cryptos in 2021 and so many african companies are actually trying to do that so we kind of like spoke to them about like look at what we're trying to do does it make sense to you and then 
all of a sudden we got talking and the partnership happened. So I think many of the partnership we are doing right now is from an impact perspective. Okay, what is this company willing to bring to the Web3 fast truck ecosystem in Africa? What level of impact are they having? And then we also analyze the number of user-based companies have and the rest of that, especially at this early stages right now, to bring them into the uh, partnership with Yuki. So it's all about impact. It's all about the ability of the company to uh, to to build and how the CEO sees things. And are they a pioneering company or are they just a company that just sits on the sideline and wait for somebody else to do it? And before they join the the moving uh hype train or something like that. That is basically how we analyze our business. In terms of uh, your partners, would you be open to sharing some of the other clients and partners you're working with across Africa? Yeah, I think we have some extensive partnership rights. We, uh, there's a company called uh, uh, yeah, Route Money in Kenya over there. So it's a B2B payment company. We have a lot of some companies, uh, Gonana Farm. Uh, Gonana Farm is a commodity marketplace here in Nigeria. They, they're still building already. And then we have some very interesting companies like ER and so many other partners we are currently talking with. Uh, we are speaking to, I think, around 15 to 20 companies currently, analyzing uh, what's it called, uh, go to market and pilots, different pilots, because we, are, we want to run the pilots based on use case basis currently. So, yeah, we have a lot of companies' interest shown up after you actually published that article. We, so many people came to asking questions and we started talking to so many people. And right now we kind of like, we are sticking to go, go publicly first with Aladdin and launch the pilot with Aladdin and then simultaneously bring every other person on board. But we have uh, with least uh, um, agreements signed with so many uh, partners that we're working with currently. Indeed, indeed. I mean, I think, I think that article got quite a lot of interest. Um... Because sure. I, I think what, what we've noticed is uh, most people are not aware which companies do you work with, which companies are offering this solution. So it's really great to see an African company offering these solutions. So yeah, congratulations on you guys and what you're doing. Um, now, going into, I think you did mention Cello Camp. I noticed that, uh, yeah, you guys were part of the Cello Camp Tell us a bit about that experience. How was it like and how, and what did you guys learn from that? Yeah, I think Solo Camp was actually, um, well, I say, I think it had a very big bring, uh, impact on the mindsets of how we are building our products. Um, per se, that, uh, that is how I can actually categorize it from the mindset angle of open source, open sourcing most of the things that we're building and kind of like, um, it just expanded let me say this. Before Solo Camp, we are a very product obsessed company. We are very 100% products focused. We just want to build, 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 and then get out there. So during Solo Camp and during Solo Camp, we kind of got sales and business obsessed more than products. Okay, we kind of like start looking at the partnership partners we have. Oh, how are we bringing them on board? We need to, we just, it just inspired us to put ourselves out there because we just we are silent builders. We'll be building in public and silent in, in private. But Solo Camp just kind of like, you know what? Just get out there, man. Just go and let the world see you. I think that's what the Solo Camp did for us generally. And yeah, I think it's been a wonderful experience. We've met so many fantastic mentors. Uh, Steven Green from Lateral Frontier Abuses, great guy. We've been working with him just so many uh, helpful uh, mentors and connections, even customers. Actually, we onboarded so many customers at Cello Camp as well. So I think it's a very fantastic uh, program for any company or uh, startup web trip project to actually look into in the future. Indeed, indeed, Dennis. In fact, one of the things we always advocate here at BKE is, um, you know, there's a tendency for developers to build in silos and uh, it's very easy to forget that sales, marketing, exposure are just as important. So, yeah, uh, it's great to hear you highlight that from a business experience and how that has helped you. I I want to go back to the partnerships and uh, projects that you guys are working on. Uh, what can we look forward to in terms of what you guys are building or what partnerships also 
can we anticipate any big partnerships? I think Aladdin Digital was quite, quite sort of a big announcement. I mean, can we expect similar big announcements in the future? You sure you shall need to expect a bank coming on UK, coming soon. Just expect a bank, a category, a bank. When I mean a bank, I don't mean a fintech bank or a new bank. I mean a traditional bank coming into the UK network. It's still the early days of the conversation. It might take years, probably a year or thereabouts, but it's something that we are aggressively working. See, let me let me let me say this right. I just believe that if let me give this analogy so it to make a lot of sense. When Coinbase started, the first built an exchange and the rest of that, and people started trading crypto, they understood the fact that if crypto is going to stand the test of time and the adoption is going to get there where they, where they needed to be in the US, they have to develop and build infrastructures that enable macro players, not just micro players to come into the game. And that is what they did with BlackRock. That's what they're doing with Vanguard. That's what they're doing with so many institutional players in the US. I think that is something that is lacking in Africa. If you look at the analysis reports of crypto in Africa every year, you see small scale uh, transactions and the rest of that. Enough companies are not adopting this technology and so many founders and builders in the ecosystem are not focused on serving these people. So many people are building payment solutions for businesses. You're building the payment solution for businesses to for people to pay in crypto. If people don't adopt crypto, they can't pay in crypto. People have to adopt it to pay in it. So I think for us, we are thinking it from a very different angle. That place where everybody's afraid of going to, ah, what are the regulators going to say? Okay, build it. Let's build it first. Let's go and talk to the regulators, right? So we're just, it's a dare, it's a very daring of our products. And we just believe that we have to go after those micro, macro players, be able to make get things done faster in this ecosystem so i think you should you guys have to really uh, expect more from us in the next coming months and weeks in the future we are really up in the ante across ghana kenya morocco as far as morocco and nigeria and then south africa as well and then cameroon these are three strategic regions where we are currently talking to big clients and customers currently. So it's still early days. We are pioneering this solution in Africa. Expect more from us. We are not uh, backing down anytime soon. Awesome, awesome. Uh, that's good to hear. Um, definitely, I'm sure your partners or potential partners will be glad to hear that. Um, as we wind up, Dennis, um, you've given quite you know a bit of uh, advice, even from a business perspective, but you know, talking to Web3 entrepreneurs on the continent, uh, what sage advice would you give? I mean, from your success so far, what would you say has defined your success up to this point that other Web3 entrepreneurs can emulate? One thing I can say, I was recently working out an application for Alliance, Alliance DAO. They asked the particular question and I told them, Perseverance is just as simple as it is. Perseverance. I, uh, we've always persevered. We've spoken to so many, like, just persevere. It's not easy to build on the continent, right? But just persevere, put yourself out there, talk to users. Like, the first thing you should do when you have a solution or a problem you're trying to solve, talk to the person you're looking to solve it for. We got Aladdin partnership even before we wrote an API code like even a single code, like before we wrote anything, we've closed down two companies already. So just talk to users, be sales distribution obsessed. If you build a fantastic product and nobody's using it, you have not built anything. But if even if you don't have a product, you have a lineup of customers, man, you are the winner, definitely. So I think just talk to users, talk to users, talk to users, talk to users. I think that's the sage advice. Early on, not later or when the product is ready or when you need to have enough websites and the rest of it. Just go out there, meet the people you are building this thing for, connect with them and detach from the nerd mentality. There are so many Web3 folks in Africa because they can write some bunch of code, they sit in their house and they close their ear to the world. Connect to reality and build something you understand and use. Don't complicate things for everybody. Not everybody is a crypto bro, a crypto sis. Just 
break it down, make sure people understand you, connect, connect, talk to people. That is how we get the next 1 billion users. If we don't do all these things, I'm not sure we're getting, we are going anywhere, but yeah, that's it. And my final advice, try as much as possible to build a decentralized infrastructure. Just try and make it decentralized, right? If possible, make it non-custodial, hand down the control over the user. It saves you a lot of stress. It saves you a lot of money. It saves you so many injuries in the future. I, it's very, very important that is you do that. I love that. Talk to users, be self-obsessed and build decentralized solutions. Um, thank you so yeah. much, Dennis. I can't, I can't thank you enough for, for those words of wisdom um, from your experience building Yuki. Maybe as we wind up, for people who want to reach out to you, for people who want to partner with you, for people who want to use your product, where can they go to? How can they reach out? Yeah, you can actually check out get get dash yuki dot com. Get get like G E T dash yuki. Yuki is Y U K I dot com. Or you can look me up on LinkedIn, uh, Dennis Mary underscore. That is uh, sorry on Twitter, Dennis Mary underscore. I'm on LinkedIn as well, Dennis Mary. I think I'm the only Dennis Mary on LinkedIn. Yeah, I don't have any other Dennis Mary. Just look me up and then um, just type Dennis Mary. You can reach out to me. If you really want to write me an email, just Dennis Mary at comiblock.com. So comiblock, C-O-M-O-I-B-L-O-C-O-K. -O 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 um, yeah, the block. So just write me an email. I'm always here. You can also reach out to David. Yeah, he's going to connect you to me directly. So <laughs> he's my guy. So yeah, <laughs> I'm here. Definitely, and then we'll have uh, those details at the bottom of this, you know, video as well. But thank you so much, Dennis, for talking to us. Uh, we really appreciate mm -hmm. the conversation.